All right, good morning, guys. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. If I've not met you, my name is Aaron, and I have a real talent at eating charcuterie boards, so <laughs> all the stuff on there. In fact, this looks like a great charcuterie board right here, right? Just every week, you know. Thanks for the laugh, Beth, my wife, at the back. I had, I had a strategic pause expecting laughter, and she was there for me. The rest of you were not. Okay, so uh, I don't want applause for this, but hey, we are in part 19 of our Philippians series, and, and we're finishing up today, and it's, it's been a blessing just to go through the scripture with you and just to see what God has to say, and so now we're entering holiday season next week. Jacob's preaching. I'm excited to hear him next week, and then uh, we'll have, uh, we'll have um, entering into Advent shortly thereafter. So thanks for hanging with me here. And, and I know that this book uh, is about joy and we found joy coming from contentment and from finding who we are in Christ. Today, my message is titled Influencers in the Family. And as we look at those last few verses in the book of Philippians, uh, I, I want to bring out a point of, of how the family of God functions and how the Lord uses all of our gifts for his purposes and for his kingdom. So let's start with verse 21 and we'll end with verse 23. As the original listeners heard these words to conclude the book of Philippians from Paul as he sent it from prison to them. He concluded by saying, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I heard a story of a bivocational pastor, which is most pastors in America, who who would work for the church part-time, and then he would clean houses. And because he was a trusted person in the community, he would clean houses of really influential people. So he was cleaning the house of a famous actress that if I told you her name or if she walked in this room, every single one of you would know who she was. Uh, just one of, one of the most famous actresses of our, of our generation. And he got to talk to her, and she asked him about what he did and he told him told her he was a pastor and they had a spiritual conversation and then she said I, I would like to maybe visit your church sometime and he pastored a church with 30 or 40 people from what I remember and he kind of instinctively said this and I regret that he said this uh, from from um, you know from this natural reaction he said you can't do that he said if you did that People would freak out and wouldn't know what to do. Now, now I hear that, and, and I'm not saying I would, hand, I would have handled that situation any better. So it's not necessarily a criticism of him as much as it is an observation about all of us. Is that those who are famous or well-known or those we admire, uh, sometimes we, we react to them in such a way that is not kingdom-focused are, is not focused on what the gospel is. Our church exists to know his love and to share his love. And so we, we have great services and Bible studies, and we're going to continue to grow in those areas and get deeper in community and deeper in the word. But we're not called just to hold in all of that spiritual energy and all of that spiritual life. We have a story to tell. We have a God to share. We have a pathway that's available. And whether it's someone who is, is at the, the bottom of society from a worldly perspective who is struggling or whether it's someone we admire and we would have paid to hear them speak or sing or play a sport, every single person is valuable to God and is equal to God. And we're called to know his love and to share his love with every single person. And that's why I, I like this greeting and this, this greeting here. And my, my first organizational point is in this scripture, I see that every saint is greeted. Every saint is greeted. And the saints are not, uh, you know, people who were identified by the Vatican in Rome. The saints were every person 
who's been redeemed by Jesus Christ. So every person in this room is a saint. Every person in this room has been sanctified and is growing in sanctification because of the work of Jesus. And so we see in verse 21, as we go back and break down the, these last scriptures, it says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And the idea here is this, is I'm getting this, is that if we're gathering for worship, we're gathering for a barbecue on the front lawn like we did last Sunday, are we gathering in small groups? Every person matters. Everyone has a name. Everyone has a story. And we greet everyone because every person matters. That's why when we've, you know, when we've organized our services here, the one thing we've never cut out, except for some, some temporary health protocol, we've never cut out the greeting of one another. In, in more traditional settings, uh, we, we say the passing of the peace. This idea is that the peace of God comes through our greeting. It comes through our interaction. It comes through our relationship. It comes through our proximity. And so we see right away this idea of greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The apostle James talks about the sin of favoritism. That when we favor some people because of their power, are their influence, are their money, are the fact that they're attractive, or the fact that they're well connected, or the fact that they are part of civic government. If we show people like that favoritism over someone else, that's a sin. James chapter 2, verse 1 says it clearly. My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And if you go back and you read the whole context of that, the verses after that, you'll see he's very clear that those who are poor among us should be honored just as much as those who are wealthy and powerful and connected. And so Jesus, when he changes our hearts, he changes the tendency we have to show favoritism. And so that's one of those things that God has to keep working in us, through us, with us. And I don't think we need to be paranoid about recognizing someone's position, recognizing someone's title. That's not necessarily a sin, or that is not a sin. I'll clearly say that. It's a sin when we exclude others to try to give special honor uh, to, to those who have earthly power. So the question I have for this connected to my opening story is this. Christ is the love church. If Someone you really admired, someone who you looked up to because maybe they, they were a musician, an athlete, a politician, well-known. If they attended one of our services, will it be too big of a moment for us? Will we have this sense of excitement and euphoria that would diminish Jesus and his glory and honor? And what does that say about us? Now, certainly if that would happen, we would want to show that person the same love and the same uh, friendliness that we do any person. But I think it's a question worth asking, not strategically, but for our hearts. I don't know of any plans of anyone famous coming in the next few weeks, so this is not preparing us for a moment. But, but if it happened in the next service at 1045 today, could we handle it? Or are we just a bunch of fanboys and fangirls who want to get our selfies with somebody? So in the kingdom of God, that person is important. And so is a person that we've only encountered for the first time. Every single person is important and every single person matters. One of the first schools I attended was a, a fundamental Baptist church. I went there during the week. I didn't go to church there on Sunday, but I went there for school during the week. And so um, in that tradition, um, we don't, they, they did not use formal titles like reverend, which, which don't use that on me if it, because I'm not revered, but uh, we didn't use formal titles like, like even pastor, but we did call people brother. So it was Brother Smith or Sister Thompson our brother Johnson, and the idea about that, the idea was, well, we're, we're all equal, but, but that term brother or sister is signifying 
a level of respect. But as things happen, as time went on, uh, what was intended to be a, a, a communication of we're all brothers and sisters uh, kind of became a ranking, and that tends to happen. But this brings me to my second observation today. We are brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters. Now, I'm going to read the same scripture in the NIV because um, the NIV, which is the most widely read Bible in America, uh, sometimes they will include sisters where other versions only include brothers. And so in verse 21, it says, the brothers and sisters are with me, send their greetings. Well, that is CSB, so you see the comparative there. So no, no, no problem. It's not a big point, not a big deal. The book of Philemon is interesting. The book of Philemon is... Uh, about a slave who, who escaped his master and then encountered the ministry of Paul and became a very close confidant of Paul. Philemon is only one chapter. If you've never read a book of the Bible, say, I've never read a book of the Bible, you can read Philemon in 10 minutes and check that off your to-do list. But Philemon is a beautiful letter because it's pragmatic when it was originally sent. But we find in it just a great principle that someone who escaped as a slave became very valuable to the, to the Apostle Paul and, and showed great value to him. And so he returned this slave under that economic system, which is a little bit different than what we think about in American slavery. It, it, it's more of a debtedness issue. And he sends him back and says, I'm sending him back, not as a slave, but I'm sending him back as a Christian brother. And so we see in verse 12, to give you a sample of this, Philippians, uh, excuse me, Philemon, uh, verse 12 says, I'm sending him back to you. I am sending, and look at this phrase, my very own heart. Isn't that a beautiful way to phrase that? I'm sending this runaway slave. I'm sending you my very heart. And then further down in verse 15, he says this, for perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a br brief time, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He's especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This, the, this is a beautiful letter written for practical reasons, but we see deep spiritual truths embedded here. And there's all types of, of ways we can see Jesus and the work of the gospel towards us in this. But I, I want you to see this tradition we have that has become muddied and maybe we feel like it's old-fashioned, Brother Allison or, you know, Brother Johnson or, or, or Sister Taylor. No, the original intent of that habit was to remind us that through Jesus, we are brothers and we are sisters. Through Jesus, those who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, those who have been redeemed by his grace, those who have been adopted in the family, we're family members. And often we, we treat other Christians in, because we have this rare advantage of, of living in a, an area where the majority of people claim to be Christians. Um, I know that's that trend, the trends are not looking good, but the stats still say the majority of people still claim to be Christians. And so it just kind of becomes this muddy kind of understanding, oh, yeah, well, everyone is a Christian. They filled something out on the, on the census saying they were a Christian. And, and we lose the, the amazing relationship that we do have. I, I want to remind you that we don't compete with other churches in our area, churches that believe in the historic faith and in the Bible because they're brothers and they're sisters. We're not in competition. We are doing the same work at different parts of the county, different parts of the area. And we become, we, we come into relationship with people and sometimes that relationship starts out in in business, or maybe it starts if you if you know someone who their their child was on the same softball team as your child, or so on. All of these different relational connections, and once we discover they're believers, they're not just another parent on the team. They're not just someone who works in our department. They're not just someone who lives on our street. They're brothers and they're sisters in Christ. 
And when we begin to really claim that identification that the scripture calls us to, it changes the way we treat them. It changes the way we see them. It changes the way we relate to them. And, and I've found myself through the years, unfortunately, many times when I've been angry at another Christian. Sometimes these were well-known people I didn't know personally, but I didn't like their demeanor or didn't like their choices or didn't like their style even. And I've had to remind myself, well, that's a brother in the Christ. That's a sister in Christ. And so I can't dismiss them. I can't, I can't write them out of my life. I'm going to spend eternity with them. And isn't this great that we see this, this pattern here, uh, as, as Paul wrote to us and said, you know, greet the brothers and sisters, greet, greet the brethren. And, and we see another letter where he's saying, like, don't treat, don't treat this runaway slave as such. Treat him differently now. Treat him as a brother. And our relationships should be moving towards family, not away from family. So we should, we should see other believers we identify in our circles becoming more like brothers and sisters, not becoming less and not becoming more distant. Here's my third observation. And, and this is kind of a setup to get to point number three. Point number three is kind of the heart of this teaching. There are influencers in the family. I'm reminding you, greet all the saints. Greet all the brothers and sisters. I'm reminding you, James said, don't show favoritism. But there's a reason here that Paul chose to identify a, a unique role of some of the believers. Go to verse 22. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. So there's a bit of speculation here, but it's, it's, it's easy speculation. It's not a stretch here. The emperor Nero at the time who would persecute Christians Someone was connected to Nero. Could it have been at the most basic, the, the most basic connection, the guards who were, who were looking over Paul as, as he was imprisoned? Or could it have been someone in the church of Rome who was at a high level in, in Caesar's government, in Nero's government? But there was a reason. He said, greet all the saints, and all the saints here greet you, and those of Caesar's household. There was, there was something that was encouraging about that. And when we move past the, the kind of earthly wonder we have in meeting those who are well-connected and famous, then we can acknowledge that God is placing believers in strategic places. And that in all realms, I believe in education, in entertainment, in government, in the military... God is strategically placing his people to be light, to be the seasoning of God as salt, to be in influential places. And you see all through the Old Testament, God raising up people for strategic times with strategic connections in strategic places. It doesn't make those people more important than the anonymous Christian or the one who is not known in this earth. But it is an encouragement to us in the sovereignty of God and the placement of God. And so I, I want to share with you a few examples of this in the New Testament, of how God uses influential people. We know this is because we all have influence to develop and we all have influence to spend. And so we develop our influence for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. And we spend our influence for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. Not to accumulate personal power. Not to accumulate personal wealth. But we're part of a family and we're in a call. And God has given us talents and gifts and connections. God has given us relationships. God has given us abilities. And those are um, important to the family of God. We have influencers in the family of God, not because influencers validate us. I don't need to say, well, our church is great because we've got this, this person here and this person has this profession and this person is a millionaire. And this. That doesn't make us better. Uh, Jesus makes us better. Jesus is, is our glory. Jesus is the one we brag about. But the church can be encouraged 
that he has gifts that is, that is moving through all sectors of society because God loves people in government and he loves people in entertainment. God loves Hollywood because he, he loves the people in Hollywood. God loves New York City. You know, the old you know, preachers love to, it's been a tradition for 100 years now to talk about Hollywood and talk about New York. Man, the Lord loves the people in Hollywood. And he loves the people in New York. And I'm not going to belittle you by giving some lame joke about California because I'm praying for revival in California. And I'm praying that the Lord is going to raise up his church there. There are great churches and great people there that he's going to raise up. And it may be that I've, I've benefited by so many Californians moving to our church, but maybe some Tennesseans are called to move to California. And they're called to move to Oregon. And they're called to move to Vermont. And they're called to move to Maine. They're called to move to bring the glory and the presence of God there. Because the Lord is strategically placing people at different places. So Joseph of Arimathea, he, he, came to, he came to the Sanhedrin and he asked for the body of Jesus to bury. So we can see from the scripture that he had access to power. He had an open door. He, he had a way to get in. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, here after our Lord had died, had willingly and sovereignly and voluntarily died. When it was evening, this is verse 57, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came. Wait a second. Hey, we live in the age of class warfare here. Rich, can you be rich and be a Christian? Absolutely. Absolutely, if you're submitted to the Lordship of Christ. If, if you're living for his glory, a rich man named, from Arimathea named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. And he approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And then Pilate ordered that it be released. And so Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb. How many know prob probably or obviously took resources to have a new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. And he left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. I see someone with influence and with resources stepping up to take care of our Lord's body before his resurrection. His, his resources, his influence were for the glory of God and for Jesus. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. This is a scripture we actually read last week when I was talking about uh, people who supported the gospel and reminding us of the women who supported Jesus. And I said, hey, keep this in mind for next week. Well, here we are. It's next week. Verse 3, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. What's a steward? A steward is someone who is over the finances, managing, managing all the things, all the resources under Herod. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. Again, we see here, we see here that God had strategically placed jo, uh, Chusa in Herod's household, and Herod trusted him to be a steward of all that he had. Let's go to Acts, uh, 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 Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. There was a conflict between the disciples and the Jewish leaders. And we pick up the story in verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Who do they want to kill? The followers of Jesus. But a Pharisee named Gamala. Now look at this. A teacher of the law who was respected by all the people. And there he had the equity of respect. The equity of favor with the people. So it's not always a resource issue here. This is a respect issue. Uh, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. 
It's, it's good to have someone wise say, hey, be careful about what's about to happen. So in the present case, I can tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God, and they were persuaded by him. Now, the question is here was, um, Gamaliel, was he a believer? We don't know for sure, but church tradition believes that he was. And he certainly was in a strategic time to speak for believers. You are, you are accumulating respect Every time you make a good decision, every time you hold your tongue when you want to tell somebody off, every time when you give wisdom when people are acting foolish, you gain more respect. And that respect that you gain can be spent for the kingdom of God at a time you don't expect. God's going to use your respectability to be a voice when he needs your voice to build the kingdom. Why? Because we have influencers in the family. There are influencers in this church. There is influence in front of you because of God's plan. Let's now turn to Acts 16. There was a, a lady named Lydia who was actually connected to the Philippians church. So it's, it's a, an appropriate time to talk about her because we've been in the book of Philippians. Starting with chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went out the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A God-fearing woman, that's someone who was um, part of Judaism and, and observed the, the, the practices of, of the Jewish faith. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. And look at this, the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. Isn't that a beautiful phrase, what happens when the gospel is preached? And after she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So we see there a woman with a home, with a business, a woman of curiosity who was, who was, you know, was researching the Jewish faith, and God opened her heart to the gospel. And then she was in Philippi. So she was part of the very church that was greeted in the scripture that we have. So let me give you a personal application to all of this, and you've felt it as I've talked. Here's a personal application. Is one is develop your influence. Develop, develop your influence. Whatever you do, get better in the name of Jesus. Raise that grade, get more punctual, be more focused at work, read something you've not read before, listen to a podcast that stretches your mind, have an experience that you haven't had in a while, increase your capacity to, to have influence, make choices that increase your character in your life, develop your influence. We're not called just to breathe and eat and sleep until he comes again. We're called to partner with God to influence the world for Jesus. Second, leverage your influence. You just keep that slide up for a second. Leverage your influence for the kingdom of God. Those things that you're good at, those doors that God opens, those talents that you have, those connections that you make, don't hoard them for your benefit. You're part of the family. Help the brothers and sisters. Help the brothers and sisters. Help the kingdom of God and pray and support Christian influencers. And I'm not talking about hashtag influencers, like you know, people selling uh, lotion and stuff, that kind of influencers, in case, in case you know, some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I, I got to the end of the sermon, I'm like, I have to rewrite this whole sermon because of the term influencers, but uh, someone encouraged me to just make it a joke, and so I did. Pray and support Christian influence. You know, brothers and sisters that are, are trying to be a light, trying to be salt. Sometimes we're more critical of people who have influence that are Christians than people who are pagan and trying to turn people away from God. You know, Christian leaders aren't perfect, flawless. Christian leaders make mistakes, and we can call them out for it, and we should in the right context, but we should have a supportive spirit on that. Hey, here's the most important part of this message is the gospel application. Here's a gospel application. Jesus' 
death and resurrection. Include us in the family of God. That's why we can say, brother and sisters, because of Jesus. Jesus' death and resurrection included us in the family of God and gives us influence for his glory. He, that's, that's what happens. Jesus included us. What he did through his death and what he did through his resurrection brought us into the family. We're not outsiders. We're insiders because of Jesus. We've got a name. We're part of a family. We don't call each other brothers and sisters because of some kind of old habit. We do that because we really are. We're part of the family. We're part of the family of God. We're in relationship with each other. And the cross and the resurrection is what did it. It didn't come from our own morality. It didn't come from our will. It didn't even come from our decision because our decision was just a response response to his grace. It came because Jesus did it all for us and through us and to us. He is worthy to be praised. And so the last verse of Philippians, the last verse is verse 23, and it's so fitting with our gospel application. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let the grace be with your spirit. The grace of the Lord, that spirit, that spirit that is hostile to God without grace. That spirit that is an enemy of God when left on its own, grace comes and brings us in. Grace doesn't just invite us in, great woos us in and calls us in to this family and to this kingdom. And so here at the cross, we're equal. We don't show favoritism because everyone is important. And God's raising up, there's influencers we already have in the church, and there'll be more influencers in the future. And there's some people who aren't influencers today, but it, watch out a year from now, a decade from now, they're gonna be influencers like, like they can't even imagine now. And what will happen then? They're gonna give glory to Jesus, and we're gonna treat each other the same because we've all been invited in the same way through the cross and through the blood of Jesus. If you're able to, let's stand in a posture of prayer as we get ready to respond. I want to invite those who are distributing communion to come forward, and I'm going to invite our prayer team to position themselves. We had a full service, and there were many words today, many words today, and I'm so grateful how uh, Pastor Aubrey didn't just sing songs today. He ministered to us today. So grateful for the things Deborah said today. Pastor Deborah spoke some things to our spirit. And now I've taught you uh, this Philippians, and we've we've been full of words today, good words that we needed to hear, words that are settling into good soil. I believe that right now. That even at the altar, the soil, the soil of our hearts come here at the altar, and the soil of our hearts receive the word well. And so we turn to the Lord. We turn to the Lord for repentance. So there's been a call to repentance several times today, but I want to give you one more call today. Some of you need to repent of your sin. You came in here holding on to sin, uh, letting sin define you, letting sin um, be your predictor of the future, thinking I'm always going to be the way I've been. This is just who I am. But the Lord has said you're a son, you're a daughter, you're something different. And before we dismiss this service, I just want to ask you if you need prayer for repentance, I'm just going to ask you just to quickly raise your hand right now. I'm looking to your left. If there's anyone, just say, I'm, I'm praying for repentance today. Anyone in these middle two sections? Thank you. You can put your hand down. Anyone else in these middle two sections? Anyone in the far right section? Thank you. You can put your hand down. Anyone else? Anyone else? I just want, this is just a sign. This is just, I don't need validation. I don't need, I know I've shared what God wanted me to share. This is just for you. Anyone else in this far left section? Say, I just need to repent of sin today. Anyone in this middle section? This far right section? Hey, we're going to throw ourselves completely upon Jesus. Completely upon the message of the Bible. Completely upon the Christian message. And there's a lot of prayers that we could pray, but but here's a great summary of doctrine and scripture that we frequently pray. And the prayer is going to be on the screen. And I'm going to pray it for myself, especially that middle part to ask for the mercy of the Lord. And um, and if I'm going to invite you to also pray with me. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, set up your kingdom in our midst. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, renew me and all of the world. Praise God. It's such a blessing 
to worship with you today. I'm going to give our benediction today, and then we're just going to have time. And you're, you're free to go get your kids and go about your day. Those of you who want to take communion, you can come. Uh, those in these two sections down the middle, uh, these two sections down uh, to, to the aisle I'm pointing to. Also in the back are self-contained communion elements, so they're available for you. And then we want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. Jacob and Darlene are ready to pray for you. And Tate and Beth are ready to pray for you. And I'm sure I'll be over there too. And we want to pray. So if you have any need in your life, let us just pray for you. Let us encourage you. Let us just uh, pray a blessing over you. I want to just speak this benediction over you as we conclude Philippians. And I want you to put that Philippians verse 423 back up there again. And I want to include this as part of, of my benediction today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine, up, shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I love you and Jesus loves you. We're here to pray for you. The table of the Lord is open. Pastor Aubrey is going to continue to lead us in worship, but you're dismissed. Have a great week in Jesus. Nothing will stop.